This is it, our very first Made by Google podcast episode. My name is Rashid Finch. I'm a Googler here in Amsterdam. So proud to welcome you to the Made by Google podcast. So what is it about? Bringing you behind the scenes and meet all the fellow Googlers I work with that make all those devices and services that you love to use. They're the people who work every day to make a dream into a reality. So in the next few weeks and months, I'll take you on a journey so you get to meet all those amazing people and hear what goes into making all these products. Now, if you haven't yet, this is a great time to subscribe or follow so you don't miss any episode of our podcast. It is October 6th today, so that's Made by Google Day on which we announce a lot of new Pixel devices. So of course, in this very first episode, we're talking Pixel. Or should I say, megapixels. Isaac, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having me too. So you're the product manager for the Google Pixel camera. Does that also mean that you are a photographer yourself or have you always been interested in the field way before working at Google? Oh yeah. Uh, my first quarter in freshman year at my university, I took a photography class. So I've always been into photography. I've loved cameras. I love the technology as well as the artistic side of it. I think it's really common for people in engineering to enjoy photography because it can be such a technical, technology-driven sort of uh, hobby. But yes, I've always been interested in photography. I'm not a pro, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm only professional at one thing, and that's product management, but I do love photography. Our first guest has helped shape what people think about when they hear Pixel, its camera system. For years and years, he's been pushing the boundaries of what technology can do to make photography better. And as you'll hear during our conversation, better is not a matter of piling on more and more megapixels and things like that. No, in his mind, better means something else. Now, that doesn't mean that our guest can't talk about megapixels or machine learning. It's just that there's a bigger picture to keep in mind. Our guest has some creative uses for Pixel's magic eraser that you don't want to miss. So without further ado, I'm proud to say that our very first guest in the Made by Google podcast is none other than the Pixel Camera product manager, Isaac Reynolds. Well, it sure came a long way uh, when it comes to photography and, and smartphones, uh, that is. I remember my first camera phone. I was like, why is it even on it? Because the resolution was so low. And then maybe it took another eight years before it amounted to something. And now it's probably sort of on the same level as professional cameras in, in certain uh, aspects. Like, when did you see that a smartphone camera could be that good? For me, it was, I actually remember a very specific moment. It was in 2017. I was traveling and I was able to bring my Pixel with me because I was on a business trip, but I wasn't bringing a big camera with me. Right. And at that time, I was really familiar with what my SLR could do. And I was walking around downtown, sunset, on the water, and I, I took a photo of the sunset and I thought to myself, you know... My SLR could not have gotten that richness of the colors in the sunset. At that time, there were still things I would turn to my SLR for, but for just walking around, taking snaps and, and wanting to capture the richness and the beauty and the contrast, I honestly think that smartphones and especially the Pixel do a much better job of capturing certain scenes than the SLRs do, especially high dynamic range scenes. Yeah. So tell us about that. So how can a, a smartphone camera, which is much smaller still be better than those large and often more expensive professional cameras. Yeah, it's all about computational photography. If you scroll back the clock decades, cameras were pieces of hardware and that was it. It was a chemical reaction on a piece of film and light traveling through a glass a, a glass lens or glass disc. These days it's it's so much driven by software. Modern SLRs are still primarily hardware driven and smartphones are primarily software driven. We found some really interesting techniques that we can do in the smartphone space because we have the capabilities of, a, of basically a little tiny computer. Uh, you'd be surprised how much horsepower is in one of these little phones. But some new techniques that we can really only do on smartphones. That creates a whole new world of processing images. This is also the day that we're launching Pixel 7, Pixel 7 Pro. What is the biggest change? Like if, if you need to compare it to previous generations of uh, phones with computational photography, what is the, the thing you're most proud of? So if you look, and instead of scrolling back the clock decades, you scroll it back just 10 years. You've mm -hmm. seen us transition from what used to be the megapixel wars into something that's a little more photography and software focused. And still through those 10 years, we've gone through multiple phases. The phase that we're in now where a lot of the exciting technology and a lot of the exciting algorithms are happening and where we're making the biggest difference for the little the snapshots, the casual snapshots that people take is in two kind of technical areas that I'm really excited about. 
One of the ones we had a big success uh, just this year is uh, in multi-camera. So all of the Pro phones you buy in the Pixel 7 Pro come with three cameras in the back. Sure. On the Pixel 7 Pro, you get an ultra-wide camera, you get a primary camera, and you get a telephoto camera, a 5X telephoto camera. And we can do things by running multiple cameras simultaneously that we could not do with just one. One of the things that is really, really exciting on the Pixel 7 is we can run the ultra wide camera in the background quietly with a really fast exposure speed that freezes motion. And we can run the main camera with a longer exposure speed that minimizes noise. And then we can take two simultaneous images and fuse them into one. That gives us the sharpness from the ultra wide and the low noise from the main in one image at the same time. And we use that to help you take sharper images of people's faces in low light or when they're moving quickly or when they can't hold still. Oh, that's great. As a parent, uh, that will probably be very useful when you have a, a one and a half year old running around. What else is a large change uh, compared to the previous generation, you'd say? We're also introducing some exciting Zoom technologies. So one of the new things in Pixel 7 as well, getting back to the multi-camera concept, is we have a telephoto lens that lets you have 5X Zoom. Mm -hmm. And we have a main lens that's 1X Zoom. Now, traditionally, you might not be able to use that 5X lens until you've zoomed into 5X. By using a fusion technique, running the main camera and the telephoto camera simultaneously, we can use the detail from the telephoto camera once you reach about 2.5x. So now you're getting benefit from that telephoto camera starting at 2.5, not just starting at 5. And that's really cool. It means more value for the hardware that you're paying for and that you're buying. One other thing I'm really excited about in the Zoom space is it's a little out, it's outside the multi-camera space, but it's kind of a novel approach to uh, the megapixel wars. You'll see the Pixel 5, or the Pixel 7 has the 50 megapixel main camera. Mainly, we produce 12 and a half megapixel images from that, but we can produce 12.5 megapixels two different ways. One, when you're at 1x zoom, we give you a super low noise, high dynamic range version of 12.5 megapixels. But now on Pixel 7, when you zoom in 2x, we can just use the 12.5 megapixels in the center quarter of the 50. Right. So you don't actually lose quality when you zoom in 2x. So Isaac, we'd like to do something we would call made by numbers, where every guest will ask them to bring a number that is somehow important to the work that they were doing. And Isaac, what is the number you brought along for your episode? Ooh, uh, I think the number I would choose is 498 million. 498 million. I'm wondering if there's going to be someone who's going to top that number. It's oddly specific, Isaac. Why 498 million? Uh, it's a very memorable number because I computed it once and I, I got stuck in my brain. Um, 498 million is the number of pixels per second that a phone has to process in 4K video. I'm sorry, 4K 60 video specifically is 498 million pixels per second. So when you talk about running auto exposure, auto white balancing, auto focus, HDR net tone mapping. You're talking about touching or analyzing 498 million pixels per second. It takes a lot of computing power to do that and a lot of dedicated hardware to do that. Yeah, so a half a billion, essentially half a billion pixels every second that are processed by multiple algorithms if you're uh, recording a high quality video on your Pixel device. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are going to remember that number, 498, and that's just in a second. So many more pixels to be processed when they're recording a, a longer video than that. A few times a year, something happens at Google that blows my mind. And like, how is that even possible? And a few years ago, that happened when I first experienced Night Sight. It was like, how is it even possible that a camera can create that much light in a space that doesn't even have light in it and then make it so easy, right? Because I'm not on a tripod. I'm just holding it in my shaky hand and it looks great. How is that even possible? Yeah. One of the first things that Pixel introduced that really kind of changed the entire market, the entire technical market for smartphone cameras was this thing called temporal merging. The idea is that if you typically would like to take a one second exposure, it's very low light, mm -hmm. one second exposure. Traditionally, you need a tripod to do that. Otherwise, things are going to get blurry because your hands move and subjects move. And so one, one second exposures weren't always realistic. And so you had noise instead. We found on at Google is you could chop that one second exposure up into five or six or even 15 little bits. And you could get, and then you could sort of, so one, two, three, four, spread over an entire second. Right. 
And then you could merge those 15 into one, one moment in time, one true representation of one moment in time that had the noise characteristics of a one second exposure, but the blur of a 15th second. And fundamentally, that's what Night Sight does. Night Sight can do up to a six second exposure, but chop the little segments so that you get a nice sharp photo. The big improvement with Night Sight this year is uh, we're able to take a photo with the same noise characteristics as a Pixel 6, but with half the blur. Night sights on Pixel 7 now take half as much time as they did before with equivalent quality otherwise. So this, this technical area of temporal merging that we pioneered on Pixel with HDR+, and then we brought to Night Sight, and then we brought to Super Res Zoom, is continuing to show us how much quality we can get out of one of these little smartphone sensors. Uh, let me get this straight. So in Pixel 7 compared to Pixel 6, you can take a night sight photo in half the time with the same end result, basically. Yes. So does that also mean that Pixel 7 works better in even lower light scenarios? Yes, it does work even better in low light scenarios. Yes. That is incredible. So what else goes into deciding which features you bring to a, a smartphone camera? So definitely there is this let's call it a capability side, right? You may have an idea, but you need the right set of tools and right set of algorithms to actually make it work. We start by looking at the pinnacle of what cameras can achieve today. We start by looking at why are you going to be willing to lug around a 15 pound, $10,000 dedicated camera? What is it that makes that worth it? Is it file formats? Is it low light? Is it frame rate? Is it resolution? Is it bit rate? Is it dynamic range? Is it zoom? Is it creative controls? What makes that device worth it? And then we start trying to bring those capabilities down to something that fits in your pocket. And we try to take out those controls, take out the hard edges. I call them sharp edges, things that make those devices difficult to use mm -hmm. so that someone who doesn't have the time or the energy to deal with those controls can just snap a shot once or press and start record once and get the same kind of output and capability and results as someone who is willing to put in hours and hours and, and fill their backpack with equipment. For people who don't know, internally at Google, you can look up every Googler and you can have your own little mission statement on that page, right? And yours says, create more confident photographers and more beautiful memories. So definitely with what you said before explains uh, the first part, right? You know, creating more confident photographers. And it essentially also explains the more beautiful memories. I love, by the way, that you pulled out my uh, my internal corporate directory motto. Definitely. Um, had, to, I also, had to check it out. <laughs> I also love, by the way, that uh, when I wrote that, I actually get made fun of this by, by one of my friends at Google, but more beautiful memories and more confident photographers. There are two different ways to interpret that. It's it more either modifies confident or it modifies photographers. So I mean it all four different ways. But yes, we have to think about the creative side as product managers here. Cameras are not their tools. They achieve something for you. The camera is not the thing that you want. It's the pictures and the videos. Those are the things that you want. So my goal is to get people in and out of camera as fast as I can. Get them on their journey to share, to post, to edit, to create, to curate. So it's really not about camera for me. It's about the sharing and the art and the creation. And that actually brings me to maybe one of the biggest breakthroughs that, that Pixel had, which is the real tone feature. So tell us a little bit about real tone and how you also decided to build that. And then what's new for real tone in Pixel 7? Yeah. Lots of people ask me, to be honest, what feature on the phone I'm most proud of. And I've always had a hard time answering because I've been here for seven years and I've launched hundreds of features. Mm -hmm. And I never really had an, an answer for what is the most proud of until we launched real tone. What's really new in pixel seven is we're doubling down on the process. Real tone fundamentally is a process. It's collaborating with the community that understands what the problems are and really listening and giving that community an opportunity to speak to the people who have the skills and the power to fix it. So where we started from with Pixel 7 was talking to the, some of the same people we've talked to for Pixel 6, some folks who are really amazing uh, at showing us how to build a better camera. And the main things uh, we focused on were bringing a lot of the real tone improvements to uh, across the camera. So not just baked into photo mode, but we wanted more of those things to land in video mode, for example. 
So we continue to work on the accuracy of color and skin tone and skin color and skin richness, the richness of that skin tone. And in particular, we tried to achieve more of, uh, we call it internally temporal consistency. You can imagine that when you take two photos or three photos in a row, Mm -hmm. those photos are probably going to look similar, but there might be little tiny shifts in the color or the detail or the focus or the resolution or or, or something like that. That's sort of acceptable for pictures because you're going to post them one at a time. It's less acceptable for videos. Because in video, you start to see the wavering. Right. And those shifts are not, you don't want to watch the shifts happen in real time. So focusing on temporal consistency and making sure that color is consistent over time instead of wavering back and forth between two different colors is especially important in video. So we made some improvements in video that help with the temporal consistency in particular. And then we also just focused on optimizing the the skin tone and skin color across the board. You know, Isaac, of course, Pixel 7 is uh, the second generation phones where we have our camera bar. And I'm wondering, how does that actually come together? And there is this interplay, right, between what a phone looks like and what the camera capabilities are of a a device. Like everything, it's a collaboration. No one gets to say, we're doing it this way, and the other person just has to get on board. So, So realistically, there's a collaboration and a give and take when you look at the team. But it's certainly true that when you look at the back of the Pixel 7, it's a nice, it's a nice exterior, but it's fairly featureless Mm -hmm. until you get to the cameras. Right. And the cameras are really what make it look like a Pixel 7 because it has that bar, that camera bar. What I love about that is it's sort of, there used to be these debates about form over function or function over form. I love that now the Pixel has aligned on this form is function and function is form. And there's no difference between the two these days. So when you look at the back, what you see is the cameras, which is great because when you bought the Pixel 7 Pro, it's because in large part, because you wanted the better camera. And there's no mistaking that when you look at the back of a Pixel 7 Pro, you have the best Pixel camera there is. Um, because There of can how- be no doubt. Mm-hmm. That, that's absolutely true. And, you know, we've been running through some of the new features that we have on Pixel 7. I think another one to talk about is, is making macro pictures. Yeah. Well, if you look, we talked a lot about multi-camera, right? Mm-hmm. And there's no reason to put two cameras in the back of the phone unless they do two different things. That's why we have, for example, an ultra wide and a telephoto. One of the other reasons people buy special lenses, you can imagine for their big cameras is astrophotography. And we have an astrophotography mode. Another reason they buy them is for macro focus. There are special macro lenses that you can buy. So we wanted to make sure that there were more reasons to feel comfortable walking out of your house with just your pixel. So what we did on the pixel seven is we took that ultra wide lens. We gave it an autofocus module. Uh, Autofocus means that we can shift the point of focus wherever we need it to go between very close and infinity. Right. And on that ultra wide lens, we're able to focus around three centimeters away from the subject. So you can get, honestly, you can get so close. It feels like you're about to touch what you're taking a photo of with the ultra wide lens. And that gives you incredible detail, incredible resolution. You can see things in a macro photo that you a lot of people couldn't see with their just their eyeballs alone. And it's just another reason to feel confident walking around with a pixel with a pixel in your pocket. That's like the Swiss Army knife being extended once more a little bit. Yeah. And I think we've described the back of the pixel phone now. And what if we turn it around and then we come to the selfie camera? It's estimated that 92 million selfies will be taken every day across devices this year. So how do you help selfie makers, which is basically all of us? help make that easier on Pixel 7 and Pixel 7 Pro? Yeah. The first thing you have to recognize is selfies are very different from rear camera photos. Um, They're taken in different contexts for different purposes. They're created differently. They're um, composed differently. And it's almost an entirely different set of problems and solutions that you have to create for a front-facing camera versus a rear-facing camera. What you're seeing on a Pixel 7 Pro is that we are really aligning what the front sensor and front camera can do with what the rear camera and rear sensors can do. On Pixel 7 Pro uh, and Pixel 7, you now have uh, an ultra-wide capability on the front, just like you have on the back. Mm -hmm. You have 4K60 video recording on the front, just like you have on the back. You now have a sensor that's around 12 megapixels. In this case, it's 10.8 specifically, but we're starting to get into higher resolution cameras. It has big pixels as well, 1.22 micron pixels. And that helps in low light, right? Oh, right. Helps in low light. So you get more detail, more low light, and it has something called a high full well capacity, which helps for dynamic range photos like you in front of a sunset. Um, The other thing that you have to recognize about selfies is third-party apps. So not just the default apps, but third-party apps are where 
Uh, these apps that you download from the Play Store is where a lot of selfies are taken. Probably the majority of selfies happen in uh, apps you, people download from the Play Store. So we're actually partnering with some third-party apps this year on Pixel 7 to introduce uh, new features there that'll help you take selfies. Um, for example, you can use uh, ultra-wide selfies in a, in a couple key apps. You now have stabilization, video stabilization available in a couple key apps. And you also can now take video from the front and back cameras simultaneously Wow! so that you can see both what you are seeing as the photographer or videographer and your reaction to that moment in the same video stream at the same time. Uh, so giving people the best selfies for us is about aligning the capabilities in low light, dynamic range, high contrast uh, video, and then partnering outside of the default apps to make sure that the apps you're using to take selfies work really, really well. Isaac, there's another Pixel feature where I think if people read it, they might not immediately understand what it is, even though it is very important, and that is guided frame. Can you explain what that is? Uh, so one of the things I, and this is probably one of the reasons I came to Google in the first place seven years ago, so it's a bit, it takes me back a little bit. I really appreciate being able to work at a company like Google that really lets us and encourages us to go the extra distance for users who maybe have a harder time with technology these days. This is one reason I'm most proud of Realtone, right? Because we're able to build a better product for users who have historically not been uh, served as well as they should have been by technology. And, and Guided Frame is another example of that. Guided Frame is a way to help people with low vision take better selfies. Uh, it's a way to make sure that the camera is pointed right at your face, that you're in focus, that you're framed, that you're centered, and as the mode says, ready for selfie. Right. So the idea is that once you turn on certain accessibility controls and you open the selfie mode, it will give you uh, audible, mm -hmm. haptic, so vibration, and uh, color and image guidance that helps you get your face framed just right for a perfect selfie. So really nice feature, really great way to let people with low vision take better photos of themselves. You wouldn't think that guided frame and uh, real tone in a way are related, but actually they're very much related exactly in the way you mentioned. You go the extra mile to make the camera more capable and useful uh, for people that previously may not have that great of an access to to cameras and the results that they produce. And then just, we, we cannot have a camera conversation about Pixel without talking about Magic Eraser. Uh, all the things we've been erasing over the past years. Anything that comes to your mind where Magic Eraser saved your picture, where it was very useful and, and maybe uh, created a much, much better picture than it otherwise would have been. Oh yeah, oh for sure. Uh, I love Magic Eraser. It always saves my landscapes, is odd to say. It, mm -hmm. it saves my landscapes because I will often go on road trips and I will make sure that I'm driving around sunset, sunri uh, sunset and sunrise. And I can pull over on the side of the road at just the right spot, just the right time and take a photo. And I often end up with fences because you're on the freeway or whatever. There's like a power line or there's a fence and I can just get rid of the power line or get rid of the big fence beams. And then it's like I was out in the wilderness taking my, <laughs> my landscape photo, but really I was just pulled over to the side of the road. Uh, so it saves some photos like that for me, for sure. That, that is great. So I just keep getting back to what you say about helping people create better memories or storing them in a better way. But now we have this feature called Unblur that sort of helps people after the fact, maybe when things didn't exactly work out the way they wanted to. But how do you unblur something? Because then, you know, you, you sort of, how, how do you know what it was supposed to look like without the blur? It, it sounds so... Uh, incredibly complicated, yet so easy to use. How do you do it? I think you've probably seen in the news all of these websites now where you can type in a sentence and it produces an image, right? Yeah. Okay. There's a category of machine learning models and imaging that are known as generative networks. A generative network produces something from nothing or produces something from something else that is lesser than or less precise than what you're trying to produce. And the idea is that the model has to fill in the details, has to take a guess by itself. What these websites are doing is they're taking your sentence, which is the guess, and they're producing an image based on it. What the model that does the face unblurring is doing is it takes an understanding of what a human face looks like. It takes an understanding of what a human face looks like after it's been blurred as well. Mm -hmm. And it kind of takes an understanding of what blur looks like because blur, you can actually kind of measure the amount of blur in an image and what its character is. Okay. It takes all those things and it says, here's what I think your face would look like after it's been unblurred. Here's what I think it, here's what it must have looked like in order to 
look like this after it was blurred. And that does amazing things. It never changes what you look like. It never changes who you are. It never strays out of the realm of authenticity. It is a very authentic representation. It's very true and honest. It never changes who you are. But it can do a whole lot of good to de-blur photos in low light, when your hands were shaking, um, if the person you're photographing is just slightly out of focus, or things like that. Isaac, you mentioned you've been in love with photography for a long time, and now you help shape how people take photos. So if there's someone who has top tips for the road, it must be you. So Isaac, what would you tell our audience about tips creating beautiful pictures? Light is everything in photography. If you do something as simple as spin someone 90 degrees, or you move your subject over six or eight feet from direct sunlight into a little mixed shade, you can turn a photo that's boring and, and not great looking into something that's got a lot of, it's very dynamic. It's very exciting. It's very interesting. It's more beautiful. So I would say, don't be afraid to make little, little shifts in lighting to achieve a really big result. The next thing I would say is be aware of your background, but be ready to push magic eraser. Oh, so, that's nice. And I would say, know what's in your background, but honestly, you can push magic eraser pretty far and you can get away with a lot, even if there's people in the background of your photo. So know it's there, but use magic eraser to its fullest. And I think this one does go out to the Pixel 7 customers out there. All right. You can launch your camera anytime by pressing the power key twice. Just tap tap. And the camera will launch instantly, no matter what. Lock, unlock, screen off, screen on, you're in an app, whatever. It'll always launch a camera. That is by far the fastest way to get into the camera. You can have, honestly, I can get my hand in my pocket, press the power button with my thumb twice, and by the time it's in front of my face, the camera's already running. That's the best way to get the moments in front of you uh, for a Pixel specifically. I'm thinking that might be, maybe might be the best Pixel feature, you know, since the original Pixel back in 2016, because it already had that feature then, right? We've had it for a long time, and it's still one of the most beloved fan favorites to this day. So thanks, Isaac, for the three tips. Light is important. Background, sort of important, but be aware and use Magic Eraser to fix everything else. And double tap the power button to make photos really fast. It seems like Pixel 7 in general focuses a lot on video, for example, with the addition of 10-bit color. And is it true that that you that is very useful when you have like a lot of contrast in 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 the scene like maybe i want to you know in the past when i tried to take a picture of you know the sun coming up it always looks better in re real life than it look you know on the picture do i have a better chance now with 10-bit video yes you do if you were going to take a picture of a flat gray wall then 8-bit and 10-bit just as good right uh but once you start to get into scenes like a sunset right where you have this beautiful gradient from orange red to purple to blue to black 10 bit starts to become really important or if you're trying to take a photo of flowers like a close up of some flowers especially a really beautiful red rose i think we've all had occasion to take a picture of a red rose yeah uh then 10 bit starts to become really important for those colors as well so it's the gradients and it's the saturation like you see in a sunset especially what else would you say is new uh, when it comes to video? Because it, it seems to me, maybe maybe that's the question I want to ask. Is it because, you know, if you want to record a 60 FPS video, is it also actually 60 times harder uh, to create a great video feature compared to a photo? Oh, is it 60 times harder to do? I think it's a thousand yeah. times harder to do. Oh, usually, okay. And why say is that? it's a thousand. Well, uh, on Pixel, we are really bringing software to bear on imaging. So mm -hmm. you take a 12 megapixel photo, we're gonna spend about three seconds processing that photo. That's three seconds for 12 megapixels. Right. So was that divide by four and multiply by a thousand? Okay. Now in 4K60, we're doing 498 megapixels. So some things we've been bringing to video and we've really, we've really been trying to bring a lot of things that we have in photo modes now to video with different implementations and different technologies. but. We now have, if you look at the Pixel 7, the Pro, and you look at some of the phones that came before it, we now have a really outstanding video package. We already talked about we have 10-bit HDR colors now. Mm -hmm. We have 4K60 on all cameras on the Pixel right. 7 Pro. So whether you're on the ultra-wide, the main, the telephoto, or the front facing camera, 4K60 is always there. And generally, so is 4K is always there, and 60fps is always there. Maybe you're doing 1080p, for example. We have uh, cinematic blur now 
in video where you can take, they're almost like portrait mode photos, but they're videos instead. And that capability is present on is present now. You also have an automatic time-lapse setting to make sure that when you take a time-lapse, you always get a length of video between 15 and 30 seconds that is highly shareable. And right. it's going to get you good engagement on social platforms because you know there's that sweet spot for engagement on social. So always make sure you get that. We've brought manual white balance controls into video as well. We've also brought focus locking, exposure locking, and, and white balance locking into video. So you have a lot more capabilities there. Beyond that, we have more creative items, right? We have four different stabilization modes on Pixel Camera. So you can choose the stabilization mode that works the best for you. We've got the default mode. We have a locked mode for zoomed in cases. So you're you're on a stage, or I'm sorry, you're in the crowd and you're watching a stage. Maybe it's a dance recital. Um, you can use locked mode. Uh, maybe you're you're running. You're not just walking, you're running. You know, you can use the active stabilization mode that we've had since Pixel 5. We also have a mode that's made for B-roll footage. These are the very epic cinematic shots that you put over a under a voiceover or transitioning between segments of video b-roll is and we have a special mode just for that on pixel and we is it, also isn't have, that the one where it slows down a little it does yes just a little a touch yeah. just a little Fair enough. yeah not too much not too little. and then we also have some great audio features one of the big ones that i uh, use the most and like the most is we have a speech enhancement mode that runs in the front and the rear cameras that lets you get like lapel mic quality speech. Even if the mic is a far away, then the phone is far away. Correct. It is, it's targeting the speech and it's turning down the volume on everything else. But it's better than that. It's not just targeting the speech, it's targeting the speaker. But that's why we call speech enhancement lapel mic mode internally. It's because it's focusing on your speech, not everyone else's speech. And the only reason we can do that is because the machine learning model that powers speech enhancement is looking at both the audio and the video. So we have one learning model that combines two different inputs and it looks at who's facing the camera and, and literally it looks at, are your lips moving? And oh, it does that even. It does. Too. It looks at if your lips are moving and it matches them up to the words it's hearing and it tries to kind of figure out, do your lip movements match that speech so I can capture that speech and save it? And do I need to turn, and then I'm just going to turn everything else that doesn't match your lip movement down. So it's a really, really incredible model. But it's just one example of what machine learning is doing for imaging uh, on Pixel. If, if this were a video podcast, I would, you, you, you can see me now. I'm, I'm like, wow, this is much more involved and complicated and sophisticated than, than, than I thought. So it, it does beg the question, like, you know, where, where can you bring this technology uh, in the future? I think what's lovely here is speech enhancement is a use case. Mm-hmm. But it's powered, and, and Magic Eraser is a use case, and Face Umbler is a use case, and Zoom is a use case. But you're seeing a lot of the same underlying technologies power them. We've talked about temporal merging today. We've talked about multi-camera fusion today. We've talked about generative models today. Those technologies are going to power improvements across the board, from photo, from video, from the default app to third-party apps you get from the Play Store from zoom to dynamic range, to low light, to creative things like, like Magic Eraser does, they're gonna power a whole bunch of improvements across the entire camera system. Where I'm most excited to go, or I'm most excited to see what the next stage is, it, it is probably in those two final areas, generative models and multi-camera fusion. Because we've really shown with the last generations of Pixel, what generative models can do for deblurring faces and, and Magic Eraser. And we've shown what multi-camera fusion can do for uh, Zoom, for Fusion Zoom, and for Fusion Deblur, which we've talked about today. I think you're going to see more use cases in those areas. I wanted to say, I bet you've, you're already working on oh, yeah. some of these things. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And well, you know, maybe Isaac, in a year's time, we'll speak again and see what else uh, you brought with all these new technologies to help people become better photographers and uh, save beautiful memories. That's such a, such a great motto to have. Thank you. Yeah, I love that motto. I had it up there for years. Isaac, thank you so much uh, for joining the first ever Made by Google podcast. Whatever happens, they cannot take that away from you. You will be your first. <laughs> I'm staking my flag. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Made by Google podcast. We have a new episode every Thursday and our next one is going to be great. We'll talk security. If you think that securing a smartphone is like building a castle, well, you're right. Learn much more about how Google secures Android and Pixel by subscribing or following and join us next time on the Made by Google podcast.